Hello, good evening and welcome to episode 7 of Humanity vs Insanity, the Crane Report. Tonight we're going to be returning to a discussion of the smart agenda. Smart for whom, of course? You may recall that we had Mike Mitchum on the show two weeks ago uh, to discuss his work in exposing the dangers associated with smart meters. Well, Mike will be joining us again later during the course of the show. But before Mike comes on stream, um, just a couple of uh, things I want to mention about um, some products. The magazines, Uncensored and Natural Medicine. And up on the screen, here we have the uh, Uncensored magazine there. As it so happens, the um, uh, number 33 has actually completely sold out, which is the first time we've ever had an issue of Uncensored completely sell out. And that, I think, was the uh, article on the medical system that probably attracted people's attention there. We do still have some copies of um, number 34, and uh, this is very pertinent right now. Did Putin stop World War III? Well, of course, he may well have done, but right now, John Kerry in particular, of course, is trying to start it again. But I'm not going to spend too much time uh, this evening talking about uh, the Crimea, and there are many other commentators talking about that, but suffice to say, don't believe everything you read in the mainstream media, or the lame stream media, as it should better be known, because the British and American media are trying to bring the global population into another conflagration, primarily, of course, to satisfy the global banksters. Meanwhile, of course, if you have a son between the ages of 16 and uh, probably about 35, then if John Kerry, William Hague and a few others have their way, then very soon they'll be called up to be cannon fodder for the globalists. So we got to Syria stopped last year, thanks to a significant number of people in the UK contacting their MPs and saying, not in my name. And this, of course, should be the same again. In case you hadn't noticed, Whatever these guys are doing, it's not in your best interests, my best interests, or the best interests of the people of this country. It is only in the apparent best interests of those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom. So if you want to keep to up to speed with what's going on, then um, please uh, consider subscribing to Uncensored Magazine. And uh, if we actually manage to get the subscribers up to a thousand, then we have a very good opportunity of actually getting it into the high street stores. And uh, that would really set the cat amongst the pigeons. And then the other magazine also published in New Zealand or edited in New Zealand and uh, published over here by yours truly, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine. Now, this is proving to be an extremely popular magazine. In fact, the last two issues, uh, 10 and 11, uh, we actually have, I think, less than about 50 copies or so in stock. Um, the rising popularity obviously speaks for itself. Once again, if we're able to get subscription levels up to around about 1,000, then we have every opportunity of getting it into the stores. So the two websites, we go back to Uncensored Magazine on the screen there. There we go. Uh, www.uncensoredmag.co.uk. And uh, then Natural Medicine, www.nznaturalmed.co.uk. If you just want one of the magazines, that's $29.99 for the year subscription. Or get both for $49.99. You've probably gathered that the alternative media is under a lot of pressure in the UK. I'm sure we all miss Edge Media and Paradigm Shift TV and uh, Rich Planet. And unfortunately, um, although we've lost them, I've still got to say it's probably better to have had them than not had them. And so now we have to make as much use as we can of the written publications and, of course, of the online channels and uh, all support there is gratefully appreciated. Now, one other event that we have uh, coming up in um, May, I nearly said February, I, <laughs> if it was, I missed it. In May of this year, the middle weekend of May, uh, May the 16th through Monday the 19th, uh, Humanity versus Insanity, a full board residential weekend with some incredible speakers, including tonight's guest, Mike Mitchum. 
And uh, this is um, ostensibly a uh, two day event, two nights, but the owners of Uncensored and Natural Medicine have kindly offered to support the event by paying for a third night. So anybody coming along for the uh, two day, two night event will have a, an opportunity to stay for a third night free, uh, courtesy of Uncensored and Natural Medicine. Uh, it's gonna be a remarkable event. I mean, obviously this is an opportunity to get together with like-minded people and uh, consider our strategy for bringing about the changes that we all know we need to see and fast. So without further ado, let's bring in tonight's guest, Mike Mitchum. Now, Mike was with us um, two weeks ago and uh, we've had we had uh, weather wars, and in between the weather wars, we've had the uh, the Wi-Fi wars. So, Mike, are you with us? Hi, Ian. Yes, I am. Hi, Hello how are you there. doing? I'm you... really good, thanks. How are you? Very well, very well, thank you. If a little uh, tired, um, I've managed to clock up uh, uh, just a little over 2,000 miles driving in the last um, seven days. But uh, apart from that, I'm in good shape. Good man. <laughs> right, Mike. So, um, uh, last well, last time we were speaking, we were um, looking at the uh, smart meter agenda, the rush to push smart meters in, your efforts to at least slow it down, if not block it entirely, um, with your representation in the, um, the Parliamentary Select Committee. So, Mike, where are you going to take us tonight? Well, I think we had some unfinished business uh, from last time around some of the health aspects. Um, so I wanted to cover off a couple more of those. Um, I also want to address one or two common fallacies that I encounter in relation to microwave radiation. Um, and then maybe talk about some of the mechanisms for harm, how the likes of Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation actually causes harm. Um, in different ways to ionising radiation. Uh, and we can talk about maybe the impact on bees and then touch a little bit on security and control aspects as well, if we've got time. OK, well, we'll see how far we go. We've got um, another 35 minutes. Oh, gosh, time flies when you're having fun, Mike, doesn't it? Yeah, we've got about 37 minutes. So, And, of course, if we don't cover all the ground, and I'm sure we probably won't, it's a big subject, but um, then you know we can always have you back on. So, Mike, I'm in your hands. OK, can we go to slide one? We can indeed. Slide one. There it is, up on the screen. So let's have some imagery here. So this is um, an Im image that was taken from the Europe European Reflex Project, and it compares what's known as three comet assays uh, that are used to determine um, DNA damage. And what these tests show is that one full day of cell phone exposure caused the same level of DNA damage as 1,600 chest X-rays. It might come as a surprise to any scientists watching since cell phone radiation is non-ionising, whereas uh, the likes of x-rays is ionising radiation, but, but we'll come back to that. Um, but this appeared in a peer-reviewed, uh, in fact, no, the next slide that we're going to cover um, we'll talk about, but as far as this um, specific study went, this combined the research of 12 institutes across seven countries, and it basically concluded that the results confirmed the likelihood of long-term genetic damage in the blood and brains of users of mobile phones and other sources of electromagnetic fields. Now, I'm assuming that in that study, um, that was on adults. Uh, I don't know, actually, Ian, um, whether it was adults or, or younger people, um, but yeah, um, it, it's not good either way, irrespective of the, the age. Um, yeah, well, you know, I mean, what's what concerning me, obviously, is that, um, I mean, if we've got this impact on adults, yeah. then um, it uh, would follow that the impact on uh, children, particularly under the age of 16, would be um, potentially a lot greater. Absolutely, and we saw last week the, uh, the comparison between the amount of radiation that a child's skull um, can absorb compared to an adult um, skull. And obviously, this specific absorption rate um, that's apparently, you know, the test that's used to, to, to measure uh, how much radiation is safe uh, was only measured using a standard US Army personnel skull, 
which is obviously considerably thicker than a small child's <laughs> skull. Um, well, maybe if they used the skulls of um, a Greater Manchester police officer, the, they may have found that actually um, there was no radiation damage at all because the brain was already destroyed. No Sorry. comment. <laughs> you know, no, no <laughs> comment at all. Uh, Mike, on, on a more serious let's note, um, let's just go back to your comment there that the impact of one day's usage is the equivalent to 1,600 um, uh, chest X-rays. Yeah. Uh, define usage. Is that sort of, you know, what's regarded as normal usage, i.e. taking a call probably, I don't know, once every 20 minutes or so, or literally no, no, what, holding the phone up to your head? About. Yeah, what, what we're talking about here is 24 hours of solid exposure. OK. And, and I think what has to be borne in mind, I, don't ha I do have a slide on this, but not, not here tonight, is that um, mobile phones send out the same kind of pulsed radiation that smart meters do. And you obviously have a choice. I mean, most people would think it would be ridiculous to use a, a mobile phone for 24 hours. You know, you're asking for trouble. Um, that would be defined as extremely heavy mobile phone use. Well, Mike, there was a case, wasn't there, of a, a guy in Italy who um, actually took the mobile phone manufacturer to court and successfully sued them because That's he right. developed a brain tumour and it was effectively established beyond reasonable doubt that the tumour had effectively evolved as a result of his excessive use of the, the cell phone. And, of course, his defence was that there was nothing in instructions that said don't use it all day. Yeah, the, 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 that was one case. There have been others like it where, where judges have ruled in favour of claimants uh, saying that mobile phones have damaged their health and, and led to, in that case, it was a, a brain tumour. So this trend is emerging. We, we actually um, uh, published a story very recently uh, that was um, reflecting on a report by Swiss Re, which is, I believe, the world's second largest reinsurance firm. And they are talking about, within the next 10 years, a tidal wave of um, claims coming about as a result of what they term as unexpected consequences of electromagnetic radiation. Not and just they're phones. not the only ones either. But not just phones. They're talking EMF uh, yeah. as, a, as a generic. Yeah, and, and the point I was going to make was that, you know, most people would bulk at the idea of using a mobile phone for 24 hours, but your smart meter or smart meters are going to be on 24 hours a day. Yeah, but you don't as, hold it up to your head. I think we touched on last time, so, yeah, but, it, yeah. emitting 190,000 pulses per day, every day. So you can't switch the smart meter off. And with what kind of strength? Because, I mean, obviously the smart meter isn't right up against your head. Or shouldn't be. That's right, but but there's nothing potentially stopping some smart meters from being within just a, a, a few feet of um, a baby's cot on the other side of a wall. You know, and there's no, there's no m mitigation that's going to be taken in that respect because smart meters, according to Public Health England, don't represent a health threat. So um, you know, one one of the uh, first stories that that I, I think we 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 published on our website. Um, was a report which um, Daniel Hirsch, a, a senior nuclear policy um, researcher and lecturer from uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz, um, showed using um, a, a, a official issued uh, information about smart meter exposure levels. He showed that the, the humans can be exposed to between 140 and 800 times as much radiation via a smart meter at a distance of one or two feet. Um, as they can from a mobile phone, whole body exposure. This is horrendous. It, it is, uh, particularly when you bear in mind that you cannot switch these things off and there's potentially going to be multiple versions of them very close to where you're living. Well, Mike, I actually have um, um, a couple of pictures. I've just got to switch um, presentations here a second. But I've got a couple of pictures of some of the effects that uh, here we go. Let's have a look at that on the screen. Um, these smart meters uh, sometimes apparently aren't very smart because they actually self-immolate. Yes. And, and this has been um, a regular occurrence or a very common occurrence in the US and Canada over the last few years as these things have been rolled out. That's right. So um, what is it that's causing these to, uh, to effectively explode? Well, there's, there's speculation on that, you know, whether it's down to, to um, poor quality, um, short-circuiting, 
um, um, uh, and, and in California, I don't know whether this is the case here, but you're, you're having um, people who aren't qualified electricians and who've simply had two-week training courses installing smart meters and replacing analog meters for smart meters. Um, and there, there have been whistleblower testimonies that, that have shown whistleblowers who've been fired for blowing the whistle on um, fire incidences. So, yeah, I mean, these smart meters got a really novel way of heating our homes. Well, but I wouldn't call that particular method particularly green or uh, sustainable. Well, and uh, the other observation is that in the US and Canada, of course, most of the utility meters are outside the property. Mm. And, and although that is increasingly the case with new builds, most of our utility meters in the UK are inside the house. They're, they're in a, under the stairs or um, you know, in, a, in a cupboard over the front door or whatever, depending on the age of the property. But if one of these um, meters self-destructs like, uh, like this and it's inside the house, then um, it's going to be a little bit different than if it's on an external wall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a different ball game here, as you say, because most of the meters are are, are indoors. Um, mine's in my garage, but I know a lot of people have the meters, you know, under the staircase or in the case of some some water meters uh, underneath the sink um, in the kitchen. So, yeah, um, I, I'm not aware of any reports of fires being caused by smart meters in this country, but I am aware of reports of people becoming very sick in this country having had a smart meter installed and, and in, in the cases that I'm aware of they've been able to successfully get them removed. Now do you do you have any information on where which areas of the country smart meters have been rolled out and um, and, and to what extent? There, there were some pilot towns um, when we started up our, our campaign um, Crawley was one. Um, there was an area around um, Manchester, I believe, and Coventry. Uh, it was a very random, what seemed to me to be a very random selection of, of, of places, but now it's being rolled out everywhere, basically. They're going for it. But I thought, I thought that the, after your visit to the House of Commons, I thought the Select Committee actually put a, a moratorium on for 12 months pending further research. No, what they did, they announced that there would be a delay of one year so that they could get their act together, basically. Um, but that was a delay of the end date um, and, the, and the full push. So that's been extended to the end of next year. But it, there's nothing stopping the, the energy companies from going for it now. And they are grabbing that opportunity with both hands. OK, so uh, and I understand that uh, once a smart meter is in the house, if somebody then... Um, purchases that house, they have no recourse to get that smart meter removed. Yeah, unfortunately, um, whilst the government have said that smart meters aren't mandatory and we're not going to force anybody to have one, and this was following some um, uh, submissions to Downing Street from the Radiation Research Trust uh, back in 2011, um, the, the, the Secretary of State and ministers at the time said, we're not going to, we, we, we hear your concerns about health issues, so we're not going to force anyone to have a smart meter. What's happened in the meantime is um, the, the suppliers are looking at having the rules changed of, and part of their licensing conditions. So if they break the rules, they can potentially have their license revoked, is that they are not allowed to remove a smart meter if it's already in place. It's called a no backward step policy. And it was designed, um, and this is the, in the words of Baroness Verma, uh, the parliamentary undersecretary um, responsible for this. Um, it was designed to ensure that the energy companies could protect their investment so smart meters, once they're in place, can only be replaced by another smart meter. So I can, My I view can, is that I can... that is not lawful, um, but that's, that's as, as far as, um, you know, what's happening behind the scenes where on the one hand we're being told, oh, yeah, they're not mandatory, you don't have to have one. A lot of people are being duped into having them, not realizing that they're, that they're not going to, you know, legally... Uh, be able to, or as far as the, the energy suppliers goes, they're not going to have any option as to um, getting an, an analog meter replaced if, say, like your example, they, they move house. So I can see a situation where as awareness of this issue um, uh, spreads, uh, 
yeah. then a house that actually hasn't been upgraded to a smart meter may actually be worth more in a, in a free market situation than a house that actually has a smart meter installed. Uh, I mean, a smart meter effectively taking value off the property. Uh, I'd say so, yeah. Um, as more people become aware of this issue, people are not going to want to have a smart meter installed in that property. It's going to be very interesting, isn't it, to see if any estate agents take the initiative and, and actually, because they're not going to put on the details that the house has a smart meter, unless they yep. think that it uh, actually is, uh, is going to be regarded as a positive step. Um, but we're, what we may see at some point in the not too distant future is estate agents actually saying, doesn't this property does not have a smart meter and using that as a, as a primary selling point. Yeah, you, who knows? It, we, we could well get there. I mean, hopefully we will get there and that this issue becomes, um, you know, prevalent enough in the mind of the public but I think we've got a fair way to go until until we do get there. I'm sure we have. But you know, it could all, all come at once, couldn't it? So if you if you live in an area that's being targeted for uh, shale gas or coal bed methane, and you've got a house that's got a smart meter installed, then yep. um, <laughs> um, God bless you. Cheaper than a visit to Switzerland, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Right, Mike. Let's come back to um, your slides. What? Uh, where else are you going to take us? Well, I was going to come on just briefly to um, the, this uh, second slide, which basically shows um, DNA damage to the brain cells of rats exposed to uh, two hours of Wi-Fi for 35 days. And again, what you can see here is, is clear DNA damage. Um, I know a lot of children who are exposed to more radiation than, than that today from their um, you know, wireless tablet computers or, or smartphones. Um, and, you know, if we carry on our present trajectory, um, pretty much every school kid in the UK can expect to spend somewhere in the region of 12,000 hours of their formative years with a Wi-Fi emitting tablet <coughs> on their lap. Um, because, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, from what I'm seeing, tablet usage and computer usage is kind of being written into the syllabus now, into the curriculum. So um, I don't have a, um, a, 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 I wanted to talk as, as well about sperm damaging and I've got a video um, that hopefully you're, you're queuing. Um, I don't have a graphic for Wi-Fi effects on sperm specifically, but I do have um, a video that I can show you on cell phone effects on sperm. It was released by uh, Citizens for Safe Technology on Valentine's Day last year. Uh, it was done in good humor. Um, to try to make the video fun and, and go viral. And I think it's worth having a look at, at the effect okay. that keeping a phone in your pocket can have on your sperm. Okay, let's have a look at that video. Hello, do you know what's good for your sperm? Models, physical activity, romance. But do you know what's bad for your sperm? Tight underwear, hot tubs, smoking, and cellular telephones. Now, here's healthy sperm unexposed to cell phone radiation. Look at them swing around. Now this is your sperm exposed to a cell phone for just 12 hours. Look at them, they're all drowning. This Valentine's Day, don't kill the love. Keep your cell phone away from your junk. This message was brought to you by Citizens for Safe Technology. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, um, the impact on sperm, but of course, um, uh, you know, sperm is um, a very important part of uh, male physiology. Um, um, but uh, blood, of course, is um, common to both sexes. So <laughs> let's have a, let's have a look at the um, this next video because I think this shows the effect of Wi-Fi on blood cells. While industry has failed to do any peer-reviewed studies on smart meters and health effects, a growing body of independent research is now starting to accumulate. In our second set of tests, we're using the smart meter. Before the exposure, we see the same thing as we saw in the first samples. Normal cell walls, fairly separated and looking healthy. So after two minutes of exposure in front of the smart meter at about one foot away, 
we see a totally different story. Sample one, you can see a lot of degradation in the cells. The cell walls have been broken, and you see changes in the cells, which are called mycoplasma. It shows a mutation to the cell. In the second sample, we see a different type of degradation to the cell membranes. You can see a corrugation here. This is called bottle cap formation, and it's known that this occurs due to oxidation or uh, exposure to free radicals. So this third subject, uh, when we did her sample, she had to be pulled away from the meter after 45 seconds because she complained about a increasingly severe headache. And here you see a phenomenon called rouleau, where the red blood cells are stacking up, which makes it very difficult for the blood to deliver oxygen to the tissues as they would be their normal function. Every single one of these is a degradation. Every single one of these shows a trauma to the blood cells and that came from something and the only variable was the smart meter. What's going that's it. Okay, that's it. Right. Well, so, yeah. Mike, that's uh, pretty scary stuff there. Yeah, um, none of, not, those three subjects weren't looking good having had exposure to a smart meter and, and I should have mentioned at the start, the reason why it, it, I, I felt it was appropriate to show some examples of cell phone damage and Wi-Fi damage is because the smart meter contains a cell phone transmitter and a Wi-Fi transmitter. So that's where it's appropriate. Um, if we could move on, um, I wanted to just address a couple of fallacies that I come across in, in relation to microwave radiation, the kind that's emitted, emitted by smart meters. Um, if we move to slide five, um, yep. one is that we are surrounded by microwave radiation. It's everywhere. Um, we've been around it since the Big Bang. You can't avoid it, so a little more can't hurt, surely. Let's go on to slide six. Um, it's true that we are exposed to natural levels of background microwave radiation, but those background levels are tiny compared to what's emitted by cell phones or our smart meters. Under natural conditions, we typically have exposure to around 0 0.000000010 microwatts per square meter. And I'm going to put that into some context just to make it a bit more real. Slide seven. Um, so that, that was the natural background radiation. Uh, in contrast, the wireless standards adopted in the UK allow up to 9 million microwatts per square meter from each individual wirelessly enabled device. Um, that level was set by a private industry group uh, known as ICNERP. Um, and to put it into a bit more meaningful context, slide eight. If the amount of natural background microwave radiation that we're exposed to today, so the, ex the actual exposure value, not the wavelength, measured the same as a standard piano keyboard, which is about one and a half meters wide, then the amount allowed to penetrate our brain by every wireless device we're using under UK standards would reach all the way to slide nine, the sun and back, uh, slide wow. 10, four and a half million times. Oh my God. So the government's so-called safety limits allow 900 quadrillion times the amount of microwave radiation that we evolved with to penetrate our heads. And that's a different kind of microwave radiation because it's information carrying microwaves, which come with their own problems. So um, that's the amount that's allowed to enter your head. More will enter though, if you're a child, as we've shown, or if you have the device in your lap or next to your heart, uh, where exposures can be four to eight times higher still, because no testing was ever done for those areas. Uh, and there's obviously not as much bone density there. So the bottom line so, is that, um, I mean, uh, unless you're actually living inside a Faraday cage, we're basically getting fried. Um, I, I try to avoid saying fried because, you know, that, that suggests a, a thermal effect is happening and it doesn't need to cause heating to mm. have an effect. Um, uh, which brings us nicely onto, um, onto slide uh, 11 which is, you know, if it doesn't cause heating, it can't harm us, which is effectively the UK Public Health England's position. 
Um, it, you know, it's non-ionizing, so it hasn't got the energy to cause cell damage. And besides, you know, nobody knows how microwaves cause harm, so it can't do. Well, that's just not true. Um, if we go to slide 12, this is uh, a renowned cardiologist by the name of Dr. Stephen Sinatra, and he has spoken widely on the subject of Wi-Fi as a coronary risk factor. And he describes uh, radio frequency and microwave radiation as the newest mitochondrial toxin. Uh, slide 13. Uh, he explains that the mechanism for wireless radiation in causing disease, DNA breakdown and pathology is due to nitric oxide disruption. That's how wireless works, he says. It causes enormous oxidative stress, endothelial cell dysfunction and nitric oxide de depletion. So there's been over 130,000 studies done on nitric oxide. Uh, the discovery of its role uh, in signaling in the cardiovascular and nervous systems uh, awarded its founders the Nobel Prize. And Wi-Fi disrupts that signaling. Uh, slide 14, we have, uh, this is Dr. Dietrich Klinghart of the Klinghart Academy in Washington State. Uh, he's able to show that uh, the presence of inflammatory markers in people's blood following wireless exposure, similar to what we just saw on, on the video there, as well as uh, hormone abnormalization and uh, neurotransmitter disruption. Um, and let's talk about the bees for a moment here. Uh, slide 15, yep. please, Ian. Uh, this is a highly informative report by uh, another renowned bioscientist by the name of Dr. Ulrich Vanke, um, and it provides a sobering understanding of how wireless pollution is affecting not just us, but our pollinators and our birds as well. Um, it describes mechanisms for harm in depth. Uh, nitric oxide disruption is identified again, uh, as well as redox imbalances leading to cell damage. It discusses how um, electromagnetic radiation causes increases in something called reactive oxidative species, uh, which produce free radicals and peroxides, which in turn cause cell protein um, and lipid and DNA damage. Um, and the reality is, of course, that if the bee population um, does just disappear for whatever reason, then basically yep. the uh, the life uh, of the planet will suffer dramatically because nothing will get pollinated. That's right. Um, if we go on to, to slide 17, what we heard a lot about over the last couple of years was the dangers of um, neonicotinoids. And I'm certainly no fan of, you know, the, the big herbicide and pesticide companies, but I don't think that's the only problem. Wireless radiation was conspicuous by its absence. And when you read the Orovanki report, uh, amongst a host of others, work by Dr. Isaac Jameson is also really important and, and very revealing. Um, it talks about how wireless radiation just confuses the heck out of uh, the likes of our bees. They are literally getting lost, um, slide 18, in a soup a toxic soup of information carrying microwaves. You know, they navigate, they're able to detect storms and avoid them, etc., cetera, uh, using electromagnetic um, uh, sensitivity. And what is maybe even more frightening here, um, if we go on to slide 19, uh, is that some of the so-called solutions that are being pursued to these problems, um, the University of Sussex is amongst one of a number of um, organizations and institutions that are working on artificial, robotic, patentable bees that they hope to upload the consciousness of real bees to by next year, by 2015. So, so, so pollination is potentially, or in the, uh, in the vision of some academics, Future, yeah. f future pollination will be carried out by the corporations because the corporations will, of course, own the bees. Right. So it's a new market, basically. So bee deaths aren't bad news for everybody. You know, there's going to be a killing made from shares in GMO companies, biotech, uh, artificial intelligence companies, as well as a host of new tax revenues. Which, of course, from these creatures and the services they provide. Where it provides another opportunity for um, clandestine warfare because you simply, effectively, um, shoot down the, the bees in the, in the target location. Well, I mean, uh, goodness knows where this goes, but, 
you know, they're talking about um, uh, multi-purpose drones currently. I mean, there's there's even some discussion about um, smart meter drones that are able to key into smart meter traffic and, you know, detect leaks, etc. Um, and, and those things potentially providing multi-purpose services such as, you know, um, identifying traffic congestion and monitoring fishing grounds, etc. So goodness knows what multiple purposes these things could be um, could be applied to. But yeah, like you say, clandestine operations, you know, how small can they go? And what can they use them for? Well, on the basis that, as we talked about the last time uh, you are on the show, Mike, um, you know, much of what is happening now in terms of the smart agenda can be traced right back certainly to 1932 and Technocracy Inc. So on the basis that they've achieved their vision from 1932 in 82 years, and of course technology is advancing exponentially, and in fact there's a lot of technology of course that which is, which is not aware of in the public domain. Yep. So uh, yeah, this really could go anywhere. Yeah, and it's it, it happens quickly as well. You know, when when you look at um, maybe the the, the the development of technology um, in the first half of the century and compare it to the rate of development now, we are in top gear right now. You know, things are getting smaller, um, and obviously, all the while, uh, a lot of our rights are being eroded as well. So we have this this you know these amazingly sophisticated pieces of technology coming into our lives, doing all sorts of purposes, um, and our defences are being dropped against um, you know and, and what capabilities we have to uh, protect ourselves from from this sort of thing from happening. Well, that, that's um, that's the big issue, isn't it? And I mean, that's actually we're going to be talking more about that in uh, in about an hour or so's time on fracking nightmare as we see the uh, rapidly eroding uh, democracy in this country and um, you know it's a charade and of course you know we're only literally probably a few short years unless something significant happens from uh, literally uh, everyone actually recognizing that they have no personal rights whatsoever they are a total slave to the corporatocracy and, and of course the smart meter agenda um, is a, a big part of that. You know, Mike, I mean, it is incredible, you know, just how much information people willingly give away. And, uh, you know, pretty much every time you key in your email address in those terms and conditions that no one reads is the clause that gives whomever it is that you're giving your email address to the opportunity to sell that on to a third party. Loyalty yeah. cards, you know, which uh, you know, uh, are there purely for tracking purchasing habits, you know, nothing else. Um, yeah. And obviously the, uh, the, the company that is collecting that data um, makes far more by selling that data than the discounts it gives you for your loyalty. So um, how easily we are bought. Yeah, and a, a lot of people will say, well, I, I don't have anything to hide. Um, I'm not doing anything wrong. So, you know, that, that kind of mentality is very dangerous for the, the, the people that are espousing it because, you know, what data are you giving away exactly? Who are you giving it away to? You know, you have nothing to hide from whom exactly. And do you know exactly how that information is going to be used? Because if you don't, then there's a very good chance it's going to be used to exploit you. Um, as you rightly say, at the end of every credit card transaction, store card transaction, um, even our, you know, our, onla our online activity, um, as well as you know, our activity on the phone, you know, these things are now monitored. Um, and, and more and more aspects of our lives are, are basically being monetized. And what we have right now is in terms of data analysis, data mining, profiling and exploitation of the individual is going to pale into insignificance when you uh, introduce the smart meter and the Internet of Things, which is looking at basically communicating all of our activity and behavior at home um, and using a network of connected microchipped um, devices uh, and pretty much anything that we can, you know, shake a stick at. I can't remember last time whether I gave you the, the quote from Sam Palmisano, um, IBM's former CEO, but he basically said, we're now at a point where we can make every human, every product, every service uh, and, and every um, process network attached and aware. 
So there is a desire with this Internet of Things to put, put an RFID transmitter that, that tells things like smart meters um, how you're using those products, um, you know, in, in real time, and then communicate that information to any third parties that have access to that data. And that brings us on nicely to the next slide, um, which is that we have, with the advent of smart meters and this Internet of Things, 440 million new hackable devices on the internet. Um, and that is, you know, all the Christmas is coming early for the international hacking and clandestine community. I mean, the CIA, on the one hand, you know, you have the likes of James Wolseley talking, who's a former head of the CIA, talking about how this is a stupid grid, not a smart grid. And then on the other hand, you have the another former CIA head, D General James Petraeus, saying, we're going to spy on you through your dishwasher and the Internet of Things will revolutionise clandestine surveillance activity, pretty much word for word. Um, you also have, you know, right now, available to the hacking community, if we go on to slide 21, um, some people may have seen this, but this is a, a screen grab from showdownhq.com. It's an en a search engine for hackers. They can use it to seek out unsecured devices on the web and cause whatever havoc they, they, they plan on causing. So you have search engines now that are dedicated to the hacking community, and it's only a matter of time before we see smart meters being listed there, searchable and attackable. Yep. Um, you know, with, with uh, slide 22, we have... Uh, you know, criticisms again, criticisms and opportunity kind of, you know, going hand in hand here for the um, the intelligence services. But here, GCHQ have criticised the smart grid, saying that not only will it allow hackers to target individual family homes, but it will leave homes open to terrorist attack. Well, the only terrorists um, that will be attacking your home will actually be within the shores and um, will be very closely associated with Westminster, just like pretty much every other terrorist attack in this country. Well, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to look at a warning like this as, um, you know, you know ir irrespective, you've got to look at warnings like this as very, very serious indeed, because what we're talking about is putting our energy supplies, our entire domestic energy and small business energy supplies, and in some cases our water supplies, online. And in you the, know, hand, is, in the this, hands of foreign corporations as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's going to be firmware and all sorts of, of, of um, uh, doors available in this thing that have not necessarily been penned by, um, by friendly nations. Exactly. Mike, unfortunately, we are running out of time. And as I suspected, we are going to need um, at least another um, discussion on this su subject. I mean, it's a very far reaching subject and it is a classic illustration of how people are being lured into providing data about their every move in life. And uh, uh, there's, there's little doubt that those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom are finding it increasingly difficult to control people as they awaken to their somewhat less than benign agenda. I mean, anyone who still believes that those in the senior positions in the corporations or in national governments have their best interests at heart is seriously living in a world of out and out delusion. And this is what we should be exposing over the coming weeks and months with humanity versus insanity. It really is time to recognize that we have to protect the sovereignty of future generations. Otherwise, this will be the generation that effectively sleepwalked into an open prison. Is that really what we want? I don't think so. But fortunately, more and more people are waking up to me. Join me in 45 minutes on Fracking Nightmare, where we'll be taking a look at the increasing police brutality being deployed at Barton Moss. Thanks. See you next week.